Good afternoon, and welcome to the first lecture of the Studio Art Department's Spring Lecture Series. I'm Gerald Otten, and I direct the Studio Art Exhibition Program. Uh, a few announcements first. Uh, number one, we'll have an exhibition reception for Philip directly following this talk. He'll talk for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, and then there'll be a brief, you know, 10, 15 minutes of questions, uh, during which time I ask that you remain seated. Um, secondly, there'll be another reception tonight in the Strauss Gallery. Uh, assistant Professor of Art Christina Seeley's work, Momentum, Photographs and Video, will have a reception for that. And in two days, in this room, at 4.30, Christina will be doing a performance lecture, which I would encourage you to attend. You don't want to miss it. So Thursday, 4.30, here. She'll be here, and so will we. Uh, also, time to turn off your devices, please. Me too. All right. All right, it's a pleasure today to introduce you to you, our spring artist in residence, Philip K. Smith III. Philip was born and raised in Palm Springs, California, where he continues to live and work today. He received his Bachelor of Fine Arts and Bachelor of Architecture from the Rhode Island School of Design. During this time, he did an internship with Machado and Silvetti, the designers of our Black Family Visual Arts Center. Small world. <laughs> Upon his return to California, he established his own practice that continued to push the boundaries and confront the ideas of modernist design. Drawing inspiration from the cold rigidity of the Bauhaus movement, the reductive geometries of minimalism, and the optic sensation of California's light and space movement, one of my favorites, Smith attempts to resolve the complex challenge of finding a natural state of life and spirit within these ideological aesthetic constrictions. The results are deceptively simple and compelling objects that seem to breathe and move as you observe and interact with them. An incredibly pro prolific artist, he has completed dozens of private and public installation projects nationwide, ranging in scope from the small to the monumental. His 55-foot-tall sculpture, Inhale, Exhale, is featured on the cover of the book, 500 Times Art in Public, Masterpieces from the Ancient World to the Present. He was included in the exhibition, Smooth Operations, Substance and Surface in Southern California Art, alongside artists such as Peter Alexander, Larry Bell, Dwayne Valentine, and Craig Hoffman at the Museum of Art and History in Lancaster. In October 2013, he launched a project titled Lucid Stead in Joshua Tree, California, which went viral over the internet. And I'll be surprised if some of you don't recognize it. That's it. <laughs> I mean, does anybody recall when this was just seen everywhere on the internet about a year ago? Um, so he'll be talking about this tonight. It was a fascinating project. Um, Ar Architect Magazine listed it as one of the very best projects of 2013. And the Los Angeles Times named Smith as one of three faces to watch in art in 2014. In April of 2014, Smith launched Reflection Field, a colossal light installation that once again land landed him in the Los Angeles Times with a full page article about the installation and his practice. He's since been commissioned to create a permanent light-based installation for the city of West Hollywood entitled Parallel Perpendicular. He's represented by Royale Projects in Palm Desert, California. Rick Royale, the director, is here tonight. Welcome. Thanks for coming. I don't see you now. Raise your hand. There he is. <laughs> Philip's current exhibition Light and Shadow Works, now installed in the Jaffe Freedy Gallery in the Hopkins Center, is a new body of work created during the past year, especially for this venue. We're very pleased to debut this new direction in his artistic development. I'm not going to tell you anything about it, but it'll blow your mind. <laughs> Please welcome Philip Smith. Greetings. Great to see all of you. Um, I just want to say, first of all, it is 
a real honor to be here. Um, I've been looking forward to this, going back to school for a long time. Um, and it's great to be back on the East Coast um, after uh, being at RISD and uh, living in, in, in uh, New York and Boston all for about 11 years. So uh, it's nice to be back uh, to see uh, tree-filled mountains as opposed to those brown ones that I'm used to back in the desert. Um, I also just want to uh, thank uh, a few people that are here. I've got a few family members, Abby, and I think maybe David is here, and Sarah and Tom, um, that are White River Junction and Brattleboro folks. Um, I also want to thank Rick from Royal Projects for being here, as well as my wife, Lisa, uh, for her support and uh, uh, being here during this time with me. So, as I say, this is uh, the world that I've come from. This is uh, from the airplane uh, heading towards the airport in Palm Springs and looking out the window to see Joshua Tree. First, I ought to say, does everybody hear me okay? Everybody, is, everything's good? Yeah? yeah? Okay, good. <clears throat> so, my work is very much based around light and about light and shadow and about the movement of those across a surface or across an object. Um, I'm interested in mark making through light. Um, that may occur two-dimensionally, it may occur three-dimensionally. I'm interested in color uh, and, and sort of projected light and reflected light and sort of how these colors mix and move across form and surface. So what I'm going to show you today is uh, a bit of work probably from 2007 to about 2011 that kind of gives a little context for the show that you're seeing here today. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the show because uh, we'll be able to see it in person and I hope that you'll ask me questions there. Also, I'll be here for another seven weeks and let's talk about it. Um, you know, I am somebody that has taught in the past. I love teaching. I love interacting. I want to answer your questions. I want to talk with you guys. Um, also to note, I've talked with Jerry a little bit about the potential of having a second lecture that would really be dedicated towards you guys and about next steps. And you're seeing a lot of work today, and you're not hearing the story at all about, okay, Smith, how did all this actually happen? You graduated, then what? Right? So um, it's been a, a, a kind of wild path, and I'd like to share that story to, uh, so you might understand how it's possible to be able to make some of these things yourself. <clears throat> So um, I'm going to start with these monochromatics, uh, light and shadow, change, surface, and form. This piece is called Infinity Column, and it is a rusted steel piece about 16 feet high. And it is really a geometrical uh, problem in that that top layer is an equilateral triangle, which then becomes a square, which then becomes a pentagon, a hexagon, a heptagon, octagon, until it becomes a circle which is an infinitely sided polygon. So in a way, it's this kind of problem to solve, but through solving it, we find this kind of life within the geometry, right? Looking up through this piece, it almost appears to be moving, venting, and breathing. Breathing and breath is, is really something that is very prevalent in a lot of my work. Even the surface itself, because it's rusting, it is in that kind of constant state of change. This is the... Uh, the piece Inhale, Exhale that Jerry mentioned, um, this 55-foot tall fiberglass work at the University of Laverne, um, really meant to be this kind of inspirational piece that lifts to the sky. The color of it being this kind of, it looks very red here, but really it's kind of a Golden Gate orange, if you will, from San Francisco, that kind of red-orange color that vibrates beautifully with, uh, with the sky. By night, three uplights completely change it into a torch with this kind of undulating shadow changing through the perspective of the light. But ultimately, it again is a geometrical problem. You can see here when we were installing it, the top layer is actually an equilateral triangle that becomes an equilateral triangle. So that the tip of the triangle becomes the face, becomes the tip, becomes the face. And you get this kind of modular kind of undulating surface. The result is this reflective surface. It's painted like the hood of a car so that you actually see the world around you reflected at 90 degrees. So you see yourself sideways as you walk towards it. So while it has this monumental aspect on campus, it also has this kind of individual moment when you step up towards it. 
This is called Line to Line, and was really one of the first pieces where this idea of the geometry was sort of turned on its side, and that there was this sense of alignment. This was walking into the gallery, into the original Royal Project space where you were confronted with this line at 45 degrees that shifted to another line at 45 degrees back in space. So there was this condensation of the form, condensing of the form as you look at it, and then as you move around it, there's this sense of it beginning to live and almost grow. Um, and you can sort of see this, uh, the scale of the human. And, and, and we did choose the smallest girl that we knew for this <laughs> image to really send the image home. <clears throat> um, but again, this, it, what was beautiful was it had this kind of monumental scale kind of packed into this tight space. It was almost, you weren't sure how it even existed. How did it even get there? It couldn't fit through the door. Um, and then, but then you could walk up and look through that gap and there was this white void inside of light and shadow. Where the earth and the sky meet. Uh, this is on the front lawn of City Hall in Oklahoma City. Um, and <clears throat> this was a piece that really was about sort of taking advantage of the two most prominent uh, kind of physical characteristics of the Oklahoma landscape, which is that kind of red clay soil that you see as you fly over, and then that big blue sky. Right? There's no mountains, so the sky is just massive, and you're highly aware of that. So in a way, the piece was about sort of drawing that sky down onto the piece. So it's a powder-coated steel form, and then those are mirror-polished stainless steel panels that are reflecting the sky. So that's not paint, that's just the blue of the sky, right? Um, and you can see it's sort of like eye drops from the sky, and you can see the thousands, millions of blues that is that sky. The result then is that it interacts with that environment. As you get the sun setting and the pinks and the oranges, those colors get draped and wrapped around the sculpture. At night, again, uplights sort of uh, dramatically changed the piece. And the effect is really, by day, this kind of undulating, kind of fractured piece um, that, sh that shifts from a perfect circle at the base to this kind of undulating, fractured, faceted form at the top. But then by night, one LED light on the inside and a couple lights on the outside completely breaks it down into uh, lit lines, right, that are almost floating in midair. The last one in this monochromatic series, I'm going to show a couple renders because this piece just got installed about two weeks ago. Um, to give you a sense of time for some of these larger public projects, I was commissioned to do this piece in, uh, these two pieces in 2011. It just got installed two weeks ago. Um, this is a piece called Line to Circle and Arc Line Arc, shifting from a concave arc to a line to a convex arc. And these are all Corten steel. These are images from the steel yard as we were rusting the core 10. It had just been sandblasted. Um, so we were spraying it with water uh, because there's no rain in the desert, <laughs> um, especially now. Um, and so what's beautiful about these works is kind of similar to line to line, that sense of breath, that sense of becoming sort of large and opaque and then condensing and having that sense of venting and movement. Also this moment of alignment, like I'm right aligned with the line and I can see the concave and the convex arc. And then the relationship of that sun, that corner draping all the way across the 18 feet. But then this is the same piece from another view, almost like a thin eye beam, um, this kind of undulating piece. And then from the side, it becomes entirely opaque. The venting disappears, and you're just confronted with this rusted surface and the light and shadow. Line to circle shifts from a line to a circle and is about kind of the beauty of being confronted with this nine-foot diameter circle uh, as well as this nine-foot diameter line. Um, and sort of being able to see this piece uh, through that line and out into that circle. These two sculptures are going to anchor two ends of a very long linear park in Arlington, Virginia. And when you're standing in the middle of the park looking at each one, they'll appear to be the same sculpture because of how they are geometrically uh, uh, created. But as you step towards them, they will reveal how beautifully different each of them are.
in these moments of alignment and the condensing of the form and other moments where it really shows its kind of strength and weight. Kind of breaking down that surface into light and shadow. So the light and shadow works um, for me are really about looking at all this work that you've just seen and really distilling and distilling and distilling. The distillation process for me is very important and you know the faceted discs which you'll see over in the gallery these are all white works. Um, the first one I ever did I made out of foam core and I had it on the wall in the studio for about a month and I stared at it every day nervous about it, anxious about it, is it enough? People are going to get it. Do I get it? I mean, it was so distilled. It was so down to its kind of essence about light on a surface. So this is a 30-inch diameter fiberglass disc that has been painted white. There is no gradient of gray that's been painted on it. It's purely about the angle of that surface in relation to the light source. As you look at it from the side, it begins to fold and shows its three-dimensionality, its thinness. Um, and you know, what's beautiful about the show here, the way that it's lit, is that that shadow, that crisp black shadow, becomes this kind of other, this kind of third element within it. What's important to note, too, is the sense of alignment. When you stand in front of each of these discs at about eight to 10 feet away, they essentially flatten to become a perfect circle. So as soon as you step off of that axis, then they show their three-dimensionality. So I invite you to kind of interact, kind of, kind, of, kind of get close, step away, step off of that axis. I mean, just, I mean, truly distilling it down to what's the least number of planes that can create a faceted disk? Two. So here's three on the wall. What's exciting about these pieces is that each of them are unique. I'm not doing additions of these, and I'm committing to build 100. I'm going to be releasing them in groups of 10. Um, what you see in the show here is six of the first 10. Uh, the next 10 are being fabricated as, uh, as I speak. Um, and what's exciting is that with each new release, we're going to sort of add this new character flaw, you could say, to this, to, uh, to this family. So that each time something's released, there's something new concept introduced with the intention that you could take number 100 and number 1 and put them right next to each other, and they would be highly different, but obviously part of the same family. Right? So it allows these kind of parameters within which I get to work. And I love setting up rules. I love setting up parameters. Um, when you can do anything, kind of stops me. So I like setting up these rules within which to play. <clears throat> so here's the first 10 uh, shown all together, which are kind of, you could say, the great, great, great grandparents of this family that is to be. Um, these are the next 10 that are now starting to play with facets that are parallel to the wall. So it almost disappears, right? It almost just fades into the wall because the lighting on that wall should be the same as the lighting on that plane. Uh, different ideas such as this. What's exciting now is, I mean, I'm probably going to create, a, I mean, a, a, in theory, about 1,000 of these and edit it down to 100. We already have about 300 designed. Um, and so this is a, a computer rendering sort of showing what is to come, potentially. I think that the first 50 will be all flat and planar, and then the, 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 uh, the final 50 will all be curved surfaces, or have at least one curved surface on it. So here's examples of sort of where these may come. We're trying to figure out where these are going to be. Is this going to be number 70? Should this be number 52? Should this be number 100? Um, so it's exciting to kind of look at this entire kind of body of work and be working on it all at the same time. Concave convex is in this show. Um, again, uh, very kind of just about the purity of light across the surface. I love these opposing corners of shadow and opposing corners of light and the simplicity of that shadow as it drops below that form and begins to define that form. And again, moments where that edge almost begins to dissipate. It almost disappears, right, like a fog. In a way, this piece is very much related to arc, line, arc, the large core 10 piece that you saw. Right? That was an idea from 2011. Uh, this piece was fabricated in 2014, 2015. So it was four years later that these ideas, you know, they're always there, they're always present. But now, 
uh, rendered as this smooth surface. The largest piece in the show is called Crease, which really is, for me, kind of a combination of the ideas of faceted disk, the sense of bending, uh, and combining it with concave convex, right? Because you have this uh, concave surface and a convex surface that are joined by this curved edge, which is, for me, is a crease. Um, and you can really kind of begin to interact with this piece and begin to see how it kind of shows itself. Uh, how it begins to kind of try to condense and also opens up. Um, again, all of these works, you really want to kind of move around them and see, see what's going on. And even look at the back, the back side. I'm the guy that looks at the back of every painting in the museum because I'm just curious about logistics and stuff. And I always want th those things to be beautiful as well. So all surfaces have been uh, detailed and thought of in this, in this exhibition. So there's other works in the show, but I'll let your, uh, your eyeballs be able to uh, look on them directly. <laughs> so projected and reflected light. This is kind of the other half of my brain, right? We're looking at these light and shadow monochromatic works. Now we're going to look at color and change. <laughs> light, space, color, form, and change. The first piece that I ever did using LED lighting and color, really taking on color for the first time, was a piece called Aperture when I was the artist in residence at the Palm Springs Art Museum. I had never really worked with acrylic at this scale. I had never ever worked with LED lighting or electronics. Um, and for some reason, I decided to do it 24 feet long by seven feet high. Um, but I like those challenges. We essentially set up the studio in the museum gallery for about eight weeks and built this piece. As a note, I had about half of it figured out the day I showed up, okay? So uh, it was an intense experience. <laughs> Um, but ultimately, this piece is always in a state of change. The colors are moving through the color spectrum. And it's based around these kind of nine pure geometric forms, like a rectangle, an arc, a square, a circle, a trapezoid, and so on. What was exciting was this intimate relationship with geometry and color. You could step up to the rectangle and be bathed in yellow and have this direct engagement with color but then be faced with the surface of this topography. If you turned off all the lights, it was an entirely white translucent acrylic piece. So it was just this white topography for color. When you stepped all the way up, you saw how the color was presenting itself. You would see blue on the edge, red on the face, and from a distance that would appear as violet or purple. As you stepped up, those colors would separate and show how they were creating that color. So from this work, I sort of have a history of creating large pieces and working in materials and ideas for the first time. <laughs> um, and then uh, figuring out how to condense those ideas into more intimate pieces. So the Light Works is a series of works that, where I've really taken on color and how color moves and interacts with the surface in a form. And I've been doing this through two different forms, torus form, which is essentially is a donut, and a lozenge, which is essentially a stretched circle. So this is torus one, the first one that I ever did, about four feet in diameter. Um, and it's in this beautiful state where it's lit from within, but also from above. So it's kind of glowing from within, but still has an aspect of light and shadow across its surface. With the lights off, there is this void at the center uh, with this kind of crisscross from the LED um, uh, projected light. And <clears throat> then there was the very first lozenge and this idea of almost like line work, like stretching the circle, but always maintaining this kind of fluid surface that the eye was always moving around. And through all of this, all these colors are changing at a different pace. <laughs> that magenta line in the center was moving slowly. The green body was moving a little bit faster that blue on the wall was moving a little bit faster after that. And depending on the color combinations, cools versus warms, and where those were in space, there was a sense that the piece might float off the wall or might begin to push into the wall. Other moments where it felt like it was flexing, and other moments like it was you know, like taking a breath in. <coughs> Taurus V, um, one of the first pieces where I really began to work with how color would blend across that surface, going back to aperture. 
uh, about how this could serve as a reflector that could project its blue onto this red surface and create this gradient of color. And as you look at these straight on, there's this alignment and this kind of beautiful relationship. Moments when the piece might be all the same color. Other moments when it begins to shift and pull apart and be at high, uh, high contrast. This is lozenge five. Um, now starting to play with this ideas, these ideas of undercut. So that there would be one zone of color, a second zone of color, and a third zone of color. But then the fourth was made by mixing uh, the first and the second. And you'd get these kind of beautiful, sort of luscious moments. As you'd step all the way up close, there's moments when that acrylic ceased to exist as acrylic. It was a bar of light. You know, and it looked like this piece was almost hovering on this yellow. Taurus 7 also began to play with this idea of the undercut with this floating circle in front of it. Slowly shifting, slowly changing. These had programs of about 30 minutes. I'm not going to show you guys videos today. We might save that for the second lecture. Moments when all of the color zones would converge and begin to peel off. So, <clears throat> Lucid Stead. Um, I'm going to start by showing the video um, that I created after the piece because I think it explains it beautifully. And um, I'm actually just curious. <laughs> Everybody raise their hand that has seen this project before today. Wow, crazy. Okay. Um, We'll have a talk about that in the second lecture, right? Um, I sent it to 30 blogs. That's what I did. That was it. Um, and somehow, you know, a third of the room has seen this project today. So let's watch the video. Lucidstead is really a collaboration with a 70-year-old existing homesteader shack that was here on my property in Joshua Tree, California. The wood siding that you see is the original wood siding. The dimensions of the openings have not been changed. The cracks and the broken wood and the nails that are within it are all part of that existing structure that you might say has taken 70 years to get to this point today. <coughs> By day, it's a mirrored structure that reflects the desert. By night, it's a projected light installation where LED lighting creates fields of color that are slowly moving through the color wheel. This project is about tapping into the desert, into the uh, pace of change, and is about uh, responding to the quiet of the place. And ultimately, in that quiet, the project begins to unfold. It's really about kind of four ideas. Um, that is light and shadow, reflected light, projected light, and change. The light and shadow is about the interaction with the sun, and that the project varies dramatically from sunrise to 9 a.m. to noon to 3 to dusk and into the evening. At dusk, there's the reflection of the sunset within it, while the, the windows and the doorway are slowly shifting through uh, the color wheel. The reflected light is within the mirrors itself, reflecting the desert around it, using the desert really as material and medium, and placing it onto the side of the shaft. The projected light is at night, 
and uh, the, it sort of comes from the inside out, where lights on the interior begin to reveal the structure of the shack, the two by fours, the diagonal embracing, sort of those uh, lit lines wrapping around the structure. Yet within it are the four windows in the doorway as pure fields of color that are set at just the right pace of change that you're not entirely aware that they're changing. You might see red, blue, and yellow. Look down, move 10 feet, and realize that now it's purple, orange, and green. So the project really is about slowing down and coming to the desert to tap into that pace of change and about stopping and being quiet so that you can truly see and listen. You know, I think what has been amazing about this project is uh, the power of photography. You know, this is a project that was built in the middle of nowhere and on five acres that I've owned for about 10 years now. It came with the Homesteader Shack that was built in the 40s. Um, you know, it was an hour and a half really to get to downtown Joshua Tree from anywhere that most people lived. It was another 25 minute drive down a very dusty, bumpy, anxiety ridden road, sort of wondering, is this really, is it really out this far? Uh, and you get all the way out there and you'd get out of your car and then we had everybody get into a shuttle and drive them the last three quarters of a mile. And everybody got out of that shuttle, shuttle and they were just quiet. It was like people were walking into the sanctuary of the desert. Um, but, you know, there were, we thought maybe 30 or 40 people would show up. We had 400 people show up. And you know, the way that this project got spread is through photography, um, both on people's phones. Uh, everybody sort of found their moment within Lucid Stead and shared that with friends. And then we had these really beautiful photographs taken that show very special moments that may occur only for five minutes during one day, and the next time you're going to see it is in another 24 hours. So there are these beautiful moments of almost kind of a collaging of the desert that is surrounding the piece. There was moments when those worlds would kind of collapse and push together all the way. You weren't sure at certain points which was real, which was the reflection. And then just this kind of beautiful desolation and this quiet of hearing the bugs buzz by your ear and a bird in the distance or the wind and that slow shift as the four windows in the doorway would slowly come up in color and begin to interact with the colors of the sunset. But this moment, standing in front of those windows, this is the large window on the back, you'll notice that the ground is purple, but the sky is still the color of the sky. And this was a moment, one of these great moments, that I never would have thought that this was possible. I didn't know that this was going to occur. This is something that only got shown to me because I built the project and went through with it. And this experience that happened at dusk and at dawn is something that has inspired an entire new body of work. So around this time, this was opened in October of 2013. Um, around this same time, um, there was the potential to create a large-scale installation um, out at the Coachella Music Festival in Indio, California. Um, and it, everything sort of worked. It was an extremely fast pace. Um, we actually signed the contract to start this project in mid-January, and I was installing on March 30th. And I had 10 days to install it. It was up for 10 days, and that was it. <laughs> um, and so there were five mirrored volumes that ranged in scale from 18 feet high to 12 foot high to 14 feet by 20 feet 
that, as you'll see in the video here, um, transformed throughout the day. The setting was the polo fields. Um, so it's essentially a massive expanse of lawn surrounded by the desert, the mountains of the desert, as well as 100,000 people. <laughs> um, and so there was this incredible interaction. It was beautiful to see people showing up on day one wondering, what are these? What's going on, right? And you'd see your reflection, you'd look up, you would see the sky. Um, and you, you know, just seeing this many people begin to interact, uh, people were taking you know, photos, there's probably hundreds of thousands of photos of people and themselves and their friends on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Um, but although you were surrounded by 100,000 people, you could simply look up and just see the sky wrapping around these volumes. And if the, if the clouds were moving, there was this kind of hatchwork of the clouds. You could kind of focus in to the environment around you, San Jacinto Mountain, you know, tinted through this colored surface. Dusk was really this beautiful moment where you, know, you saw a bit of the reflection and a bit of the color, and they were sort of just right. So you saw the world around you tinted, a bit like that purple window that I showed you in Joshua Tree. Then the volumes would begin to interact with each other. Then you started to see you know, this red volume uh, reflecting this green volume, and the reflection was yellow, because that's how light mixes. This was out in the middle of the field, and there'd be moments when there would be 2,000 people sitting in the middle of it, uh, bathed by color. Other moments when people were directly interacting with the surface. The pieces themselves were moving through the color spectrum. There were moments of gradient, where you had saturated color fading to pure mirror, which was beautiful during dusk as well. You could have purple fading down to you know, the color of the sunset. It took about 40 minutes for the colors to move through the full program. It's sort of sped up here because of the time lapse. But it was this really slow pace. At such a pace that you, know, you weren't sure if it was immediately changing, kind of like Lucid Stead. I was able to uh, use what I learned at Lucid Stead and apply that sense of change and experience to reflection field. So there were moments of absolute quiet. You know, this is right after dawn. And you'd see these volumes in this pure environment and these blades of shadow and blades of reflection. Other moments when the clouds just wrapped around the volumes. Essentially, this is a site-specific piece no matter where it goes, right? It's always absorbing the world around it. If the color of the sky was pink and purple, so too were the pieces, and showing you know, what was happening in the east as you were looking west. And at dusk, then, those colors began to emerge. The colors were on the front face of each of the volumes, and then raw mirror on the side, so it was just reflecting what you saw. <clears throat> and I talked about that gradient of color, where you could paint the ground purple and fade it into the blue of the sky. Other moments where that mirror on the side made that entire face, that eight, nine foot six by 11 foot six face of color appear to be floating and ultra thin, um, almost looking like there's a space that you can walk into beyond this surface. And other moments where you were just overwhelmed by a field of color. So building this piece allowed me to experience this concept, this idea, at a huge scale, right, at 18 feet high. Um, and leaving Coachella and you know, getting back into the studio, it was an extremely intense experience, as you can, ima as you can imagine. And um, what I wanted to do then was start asking questions, is well, what if there, you know, that, that was five volumes, different sizes, what if there's 
four volumes? What if there's three? What if they're angled at 90 degrees, 120 degrees, 45? And all of these what if questions. And ultimately, I created a series of 12 large-scale museum installations um, that I'm going to show you, I think, three of them here today. Um, this kind of shows you the organization. This is called Open Square Centered, which was great, too. I was able to kind of develop this language about how to talk about the work. So these are computer renders kind of showing the effects of four of these volumes within a space where you enter into that center space through the gap, through the corner. And as you step into that space, how these begin to interact and reflect and change color. As you look at it on the corner through that gap, depending on what the coloration is, whether two are orange and two are yellow and how those begin to interact. Or even the simplicity of making a massive corner. Uh, the, these are two walls that are 16 feet high by 40 foot long uh, with color emanating from within. This is a gradient of green to, uh, to red with a pure red face and the sense of the continuation and merging of that color. Or perhaps saturation of color at the center that fades to pure mirror and it's like you're walking into a space of floating color. Or this one, simply two parallels, just two walls, two opposing walls. And what is that effect? Is this kind of continuating, this continuous space, this kind of infinity space, which a lot of us have seen, right? You've been in bathrooms where there might be a mirror and a mirror, and you kind of look to kind of find that, that sort of perfect moment where you can see as far as you can see. But this is something that occurs through color, and the color merges and mixes as it descends, or it, as, it, as it sort of pushes out in, uh, into space. This last one that was inspired by uh, a Flavin installation I saw in Houston last summer <coughs> called Eight Perpendiculars Parallel, uh, which essentially is these planes on each wall with one color on each face, blue on one side, red on the other, but always changing and moving through the color spectrum. And this interaction of that mixture of color through perspective that now as you move close to that wall, the colors begin to merge across that surface. As you step away, they can begin to separate. So the first piece, and I needed to build one of these. I needed to make this happen and, and also show myself and you know, collectors and museums that this is possible. Um, so I built this piece called Bent Parallel, which we showed at the Royale Projects uh, gallery booth um, during Art Basel at the Untitled Fair back in December. Um, this piece is 21 feet long, 9 foot high. Um, it was, it's able to be disassembled and put on two A-frames and shipped across the country, and two of us put it back together in two days in Miami. <clears throat> so looking at it straight on, there are these two planes that have been bent at 120 degrees. The result is this third plane here that is zero thickness, materialist, and is the merging of these two colors. So again, just kind of dialing down this idea of the kind of pure moment to show this kind of beautiful, simple experience. All the while, this is moving very slowly through the color spectrum. But again, this moment of stepping up to this color and being absorbed by it. Um, you know, and sort of your brain almost asking, which side am I on? And am, I, am I on that pink side? I know that world that I'm seeing in it. So there's this beautiful perceptual shift where your brain was trying to adapt. So I've got just, uh, I think it's just two last projects. Um, I mentioned that I like working within parameters. Um, we had a, a client one time that, I mean, asked the question, honestly, that every artist hopes to be asked, which is, what would you do if there was no budget and you could pick any site? <laughs> OK. Uh, it threw me for three days. I had no idea what to do. I had never been, I'd never been asked that question, nor had I even thought about that 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 could even be possible, right? To dream so massively big. Um, I'll say I, I dreamed so big that it was actually beyond what they were even expecting, but that's a whole <laughs> other story. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna show you um, this project. Um, there's three installations that I had proposed uh, called Double Horizon, Sky Tower, and Infinity. And I'm gonna show you still images of each and then we're gonna just go through a brief animation. <clears throat> So these were uh, three large uh, 
obviously, uh, installations that were about these direct experiences with color and reflection and light. So the first one, Sky Tower. Or sorry, Double Horizon. <clears throat> um, set within this kind of soloit white grid um, is this mirrored volume that is about 40 feet long by about 10 foot high. It's open on two ends, as you can see in the section here. So at night, at dusk, let's say, the lights come on and you can walk up this structure and enter into this completely mirrored color space. And different programming could create different experiences. This is a moment where it's mirrors on the two sides and color on the ceiling and the floor. And colors begin to you know, mesh in the blue and the yellow or reverse the relationship. But stepping inside was this incredible experience because you left the structure that you walked up and now you are in an infinite space of color and reflection floating through the sky. You could not see that structure that you just walked through. Sky Tower sort of took this same idea but inverted it, sort of turned it 90 degrees, worked with the other axis. Um, <clears throat> so, it, and it was really kind of set up almost like a temple, like a temple for color, a temple for light. Um, so again, this large structure with this large overhang set eight feet up at this continuous ramp as you'd step past this threshold and look up into the sky, as you can see here in section. So walking towards it, sort of getting a glimmer of what lies within. And then stepping under that threshold, which was set at seven foot off the ground. So it was this really tight moment where you stepped into this kind of infinite space that opened up to the sky and color. And when red, green, blue, when red, green, and blue mix in light, you get white. So that's why you have mostly this kind of white surrounding and then this definition of color as you lift up or as you look up. But you can imagine that at dusk or even in a beautifully lit night sky in an urban environment, let's say that that world above begins to be reflected onto that surface. And depending on what surface is color, what surface is mirror, there may be different relationships or experiences that could occur. Infinity then said, um, I'm gonna completely contain that experience. So this is now a 30 foot by 30 foot by 30 foot cube hovering where you would walk towards the piece onto this plane of light. And as you stepped onto that plane, it would begin to lift. To where the world around you completely disappeared. And now you are in an entirely infinite space of reflection and color. So let's put this into motion.
Okay. <clears throat> so one last project. This is actually a commission um, that uh, quite beautifully um, we uh, were, uh, that we just acquired honestly two days before I left to come to Dartmouth. Um, and uh, this is in a private collection in a home in the desert. Uh, there's this large glass window in the entryway. There's this kind of overhang you walk through, a boulder, massive boulder that's there, this grove of, uh, of olive trees. And then there's this long hallway. And there was nothing planned for that wall. And so I decided to use that wall to propose uh, this piece. And what's great about acquiring this commission is that this was work that I had planned to work on while I was here. Um, now I get to kind of work on it through this actual commission. I've talked to a couple of you about the potential of building this at a smaller, in, a, in a smaller scaled model um, to begin to study the form and this undulating surface of mirror and light. I've also talked to you about the potential of working through a series of prints and that would be very much inspired by this piece. Um, this is a 26 foot long piece that's three foot high with angled surfaces of mirror some begin to shift straight out, um, but all through it is sort of you, the, the surface itself begins to be broken down. There's moments when, you know, how, how can that be existing? What, what is actually occurring there? And where is this coming from? You know, this is the reflection of this piece on the glass reflecting back onto it. Um, so there's this beautiful interaction with the architecture and the context itself. Even to where the piece continues, almost looks as though it extends another 30 feet or is reflected on this glass next to it. So again, let's put this into motion. For me, this is really kind of a, almost like a collage that is occurring live, right, through motion. Um, <clears throat> so as you approach it, you know, you're seeing two of these boulders, you're seeing uh, the sun uh, casting shadow that will change over the course of the day. The experience of those trees across this tinted surface will change throughout the day and into the evening. And then all the while, the program is slowly moving through its very precise steps. Thank you. So I don't know if anybody has any questions for me. And if you think of some later, just know that I'm here for another six and, six and a half weeks. Yes? Hi. Great to see you, uh, your work. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if you could speak a bit about the not huge other arts. Absolutely. Play games, but not All my heroes. You've listed most of them. Um, you know, I think that, I mean, obviously, uh, as people have seen the show and the faceted discs, there's been a lot of talk about Robert Irwin, um, who, I mean, whenever I get a chance to see his disc, I go, right? Because I think what's, what's beautiful about that work, what's beautiful about Solo Wit, is, you know, that incredible distillation. Brancusi as well, distilling these very complex forms into, you know, just a line. I mean, it's just so elegant, right? Um, so I think th what's also powerful is people like Terrell and Robert Irwin and Flavin established light as a medium that artists like myself can use. I mean, they have created a foundation, a strong foundation, from which I can build. Um, you know, there was the Terrell show at, uh, at LACMA at the LA County Museum of Art, and you know, I was able to look at 50 years worth of research in a day and understand how he had done those. I'm working in that world and you know, it was able, I, he showed me everything. So it was like pure research for me. Um, so it's exciting to be able to take what these artists did, the kind of questions that they asked, and some of those questions were left off. They were left in the 70s. Um, and they were amazing questions. And so I'm looking to kind of reinvigorate that work and look back into those because I, I see such huge potential um, in all of those artists that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah in the back there. Um, like in terms of the projects, like Infinity and 
Good question. I'll, I'll, let's just say it's like going, like looking at Yelp. It was probably four dollar signs, plus. So that's all, I, and that's the top of the. So I honestly, I mean, uh, in the end, in the end, it's a steel structure. It's like building a skyscraper without any glass. So I mean, the complexity of that structure is everyday construction, and that was part of the goal. Right, is to see like, well, that, that's, a, that's a, a structure that the steel yard five minutes from my studio can build tomorrow. Um, and then it was a matter of using my own experience and knowledge of having built Reflection Field and Lucid Stead to say, I know exactly how those internal spaces can operate and how they can be built. Um, and, you know, again, I, you know, to work on Reflection Field, I was able to use the resources of a massive lighting company. Um, that uh, Golden Voice, the producers of the festival, hooked me up with. Um, so I was able to learn a lot about LED technology and the potential that exists there. And it's crazy. I mean, it is crazy, uh, the potential of all of that. And so I'm using all of those materials, you know, uh, for future works. Sarah. Um, how did you get into, get into public work? Um, you know, I, uh, I actually, I honestly fell into it. Um, you know, I, I have this background in architecture, and when I started my office in the desert in 2000, many of my initial opportunities were in architecture, and I was working with some developers who came to my studio one day, and I had all these sculptures there. I'm like, what, what's this? You know, what, what, is, what is going on? We had no idea you do this. And so, um, you know, I ended up working on their public art requirement for that project, and that started the process. This is a much bigger story that we will talk about in the second lecture, because that's, uh, it's like, how, did, how do we get any of these built is a big question. And I want to answer that for you guys so that you guys know. So, yeah. How about that, Addy? Yes. Uh, at what stage in the process do you use 3D modeling software? Um, yeah. It's like a big part of visualizing your... Absolutely. So I will say every single project that you saw on the screen today started with my hand and a pencil or a pen and my sketchbook. Every single one. I left out a lot of drawings. And I will show those in this second lecture because that's something I want to send home with you guys is to never stop drawing. Continue to draw and hone that skill. Um, um, but I would say that a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the work in the studio is an interaction between the hand and the computer. Uh, I mean, we have a stack of 8.5 by 11s that you know, have been collaged over, drawn over, you know, X'd out, and you know, so it's a constant back and forth. Um, you know, I look at it as it is another tool in the artist's arsenal to be you know, incredibly creative. So, and it's, it's powerful, right? I mean, somebody asks, well, what's this project going to look like? I know that I can show them. I can know I can show them in a very convincing way that says, yeah, I get it. And I would say, you know, I know that Rick and Lisa would say that what's shocking is that every single time we build one of these pieces, the client always says, kind of looks just like the renders. Looks just like what you showed us, you know, a year ago or two years ago. So um, it's very powerful. It's very, very powerful. Anybody else? How about right here? Are you interested at all in the psychology of color? That's why I'm here. Uh, I, that, is, that is one of my uh, number one research tasks, being here at Dartmouth. And I would say if any of you are knowledgeable in this category, please come see me. I would love to talk with you. Um, you know, I have my own experiences. I have, you know, sort of a, uh, a loose understanding, a rough understanding, even what other people have told me about how they experience my work. Um, you know, a lot of my work has been said that it's very meditative, it makes people quiet, it allows them to decompress after a busy day. Uh, and there's something to that, not only about the color, but about that pace, about that pace of change. And that something is kind of, you know, slowly breathing. There is a sense of alignment, too, of sort of people slowing down and aligning themselves with the color, aligning them with this pace of change. And so I really want to delve deeper into what is actually occurring there during my stay here at Dartmouth. Anybody else? Um, your work, obviously, you were talking about Terrell uh, and Irwin and other figures influencing what you do. Can you talk a little bit about 
what differentiates you from those? Sure. I mean, I have some ideas about it. Yeah. I think there's something particularly of the moment now that you're doing that they they were coming out of the 60s and 70s. And yeah. What's the you know, I, I, I think the best way to explain, in, let's say, let's, let's take one of those, how am I different or similar to Terrell? Um, I, as I mentioned, had, a, had an occasion to go to Houston um, last year, and I went to Rice University where he has that large um, installation, his large sky space. And it's a very different one, right? Because it's essentially this huge square floating plane with a square oculus in the middle of it. And it's all white. And he has LED lights that are projecting upward onto that white surface. And as you sit below, you look through and see the pure sky. And your understanding of that sky changes color in relation to the surrounding color. And it's, for me, it's a little bit it's more Albers, right? It's like, like pushing another color up next to that true environment to change that environment. I would say what I'm doing is I'm getting rid of the white, and I'm just taking the sky. I'm, I'm taking those things and compressing them. I'm compressing the color directly onto the actual sky. Um, and you know, I, I love this interaction with the environment. You know, working in the desert, you know, the mountains, the skies, the sunset, I mean, these are things that are so prevalent and so powerful every single day, it is undeniable. You know, and it's incredibly inspiring. And so, you know, um, you know, as I look at those gradients of color, I'm asking myself, you know, how can I acquire that? You know, what is that experience that I'm seeing? Um, I got to see the Flavin piece. Um, I forget the name of it, but some of you may know it. There's an entire building at the Manil Collection that just has, it's like red, green, yellow that just, you know, just proliferates. And it's not moving or shifting or changing, but it's just this beautifully quiet, still space of color. And, you know, that inspired that eight parallels perpendicular piece. Um, you know, and for me, it's about change. And now through technology, truly, I imagine they would have done it if they could have, uh, right? The technology now allows me to, to change that color and to allow that red to shift to blue. And, you know, I also want to directly engage the viewer, um, you know, so that as you move through that space, the piece is changing. It's not just the color changing, but it's how you move through that space that dramatically affects your experience of that color. So, anybody else? Yeah. Sure. Of course. I mean, uh, I, I hate to tell you, that is being an artist. I imagine every single person in this room is saying, yeah, I've had that, right? So uh, that, that is something for the other talk. How do I get past it? I work. I, get, I have it at the beginning of every project. Can I do it this time? Is it going to happen? Am I going to figure it out? Is it going to work? And I just start drawing and draw and draw, and sometimes it takes days, sometimes it takes weeks, sometimes I don't draw at all and just think about a project for a month. And then when it comes time to draw, I know exactly what I need to draw. So I've kind of, I, I mean, ultimately I've learned about the way that I work and the way that I work best. And that's important for you to start to figure out, right? When you get to that moment, what gets you out of it? Um, so for me, it's a matter of persistence. So, anybody else? Yeah. Um, going back to the like 3D rendering question, yeah. it seems like a lot of your work involves you kind of having to predict something that's unimaginable for yeah. a lot of people. And I yes. know, like you've gotten good at just imagining that, but how do you start an idea with a pencil and paper if like it's something that you might not expect? Of course. I mean, I like I said with Lucid Stead and that purple window, right? I did not expect that. I mean, I expected that there would be, I would see the tinted world, but I didn't expect to have this moment where I was purple, but the creosote bushes were still green and the sky was still blue. Um, that is a moment where I could have drawn all day and thought about it as long as possible, but it would not have occurred unless I built it, right? And I think there's really something to be said about commitment to an idea. Um, that's something I'll, I'll, I'll talk a lot about in this second talk is, you know, that, that whole project, all of Lucidstead, it was 
an idea I was passionate about. I've got an idea. I'm going to go build it. It's going to be just like any other any of these other projects. I'm going to photograph it, video it, maybe share it with a few people, and we'll see what happens. Move on to the next thing, right? And it changed my life forever, unbeknownst to me. Um, you know, but I mean, really, in terms of those logistics of those actual experiences, it can only occur by building it, you know, and testing it and seeing it. I mean, what you're seeing is these final products. What you're not seeing is the months prior of all the failures, you know, all the things that didn't work. You know, you're sure it's going to work this time, and it doesn't. Or those moments where you're sure this is going to happen, and something else happens, and it's better than what you were thinking of. Right? Those are beautiful moments. And as artists, I imagine you all have experienced that. That moment when you're drawing and something happens that is like pure magic. Right? I have no idea how I even thought of that. It just happened. I'm not going to tell anybody that it just happened. I'm going to tell everybody that I thought about it long and hard. And that you know, it just occurred. And I mean, those are moments that we live for as artists. Right? That, I mean, who knows what's going to happen if I build this project. It may change the rest of my life forever. It may just be another project. But you got to do it. You got to do it. Anybody else? Yeah, Abby. I have a couple of questions. I'm just going to ask a couple. Sure. Um, one simple one. How come you didn't put any mirrors in the arch of the uh, cabin on either side? <laughs> that's a good. That's a good detailed detailed notice. Um, <laughs> it actually didn't make sense. It it, it actually looked like it was additive because it was the only moment on two planes where there was a triangle. So by maintaining that horizontality, the eye never stopped. It never hiccuped. So the eye was able to simply shift and move all the way around that surface, not go up and stop. So it was about kind of fluidity of movement of the eye. And if over the last, say, 15 years, you've all the things you've done, what would you look back on and say, I wish I'd done that differently? Do you have? I don't have that, honestly. I really don't. I mean, because, uh, I mean, every project has shown me something. You know? I mean, I, had, I really have zero regrets as an artist. There were projects that showed me a lot. Some projects showed me nothing. Some were failures. But even in the failure, it showed me, well, I can't do that. So that is knowledge. So that will inform me how to make a better project the next time around. So I have zero regrets. You know, I mean, probably the most regret I have is not building fast enough, not getting it done fast enough. Um, Rick always says, my gallery rep here says, you know, Phil has way too many ideas. <laughs> and you can see there's, you know, there's, there's kind of a, a wide breadth of thought here. And so, you know, having too many ideas is not an issue. It's just a matter of, you know, condensing those and getting them done. Um, it's really a challenge. And, and, and oftentimes, even understanding what are the right ones to get done. I, this is actually an amazing moment for me because uh, I just moved out of my studio of 14 years into a new studio that's two and a half times bigger and awesome. I mean, it's fantastic. I can't believe I have this space. <sighs> to go through 14 years of built up stuff in that studio was amazing. And the power of throwing some of these things away was amazing. It was fantastic. And it was also a reality, though, of it, it, was, it was difficult. Some of them were, because I hadn't finished them. But then I realized that I got halfway through, and I realized, uh, even if I finish this, it's not going to be where I need it to be. And so it got me to the next step. It got me to the next thing. So um, you know, it, it, it's been this kind of amazing kind of purge and you know, now I'm in this new space. I'm working on these new projects. I'm very focused on what I'm doing. I have the opportunity to do this show. And then all of a sudden, after all this intensity, I have eight weeks of focus at Dartmouth. Thank you. <laughs> I've really needed it. So uh, thank you so much for tonight. And I hope you enjoy the show.